Tonight's presentation is titled, How Mags Fail. And our presenter is Mike Bush. Mike is president of Savvy Aviation Incorporated. Uh, he's also an author for numerous aviation publications, holds a certified flight instructor certificate, an A&P mechanic certificate with inspection authorization privilege, Aviation Maintenance Technician of the Year with the FAA in 2008, and a member of EAA continuing with Mike's monthly webinars here with EAA. Mike's been doing webinars for you folks out here in this program almost since we started doing it in 2010, and we sure do thank you, Mike, for, for sharing your information with us once a month. We're, we're lucky to have you here with us tonight, and I'm gonna turn control the presentation over to you. Thank you, Tim, and good evening, everybody. I got your screen up. Okay, very good, very good. Well, uh, uh, tonight I'm doing a continuation of the webinar that I did last month that was entitled How Mags Work, where we <clears throat> uh, dissected uh, magnetos and talked about the, the principles of operation and all of the pieces and parts and stuff inside. And uh, tonight, um, I'm going to continue that discussion um, and but focus on failure modes of magneto ignition systems. Um, we'll talk about different ways that they fail and we'll also talk about uh, how pilots react to such failures and how they should react to them and how sometimes they don't react to them properly. Um, you know the the FARs and the CARs that preceded the FARs, um, you know, a lot of older um, certificated airplanes were certificated under the CARs, but they, they both require that um, <clears throat> certificated spark ignition uh, system, uh, air aircraft engines have a fully redundant dual ignition system. And, and here's the actual reg in part 33 uh, that, that requires that. Part 33 is the part of the regulations that, that has to do with certifying aircraft engines. And it says each spark ignition engine must have a dual ignition system with at least two spark plugs for each cylinder and two separate electric circuits with separate sources of electrical energy or uh, have an ignition system of equivalent in-flight reliability. Um, Kind of interesting at least two spark plugs for each cylinder i've never seen a cylinder with more than two spark plugs but we all have two spark plugs in our cylinders at any rate the the faa had a, a reasonably good reason for for this regulation because uh, magneto ignition system failures are relatively commonplace and if we didn't have a properly functioning ignition system the engine could quit and the airplane would fall out of the sky we don't want that to happen um how often do ignition systems fail? Well, it depends on what kind of failures we're talking about. The most common things to fail in, in, in our ignition systems actually are the spark plugs. And, and they, they fail quite a lot. Um, but usually when they fail, uh, the failure is pretty benign. In fact, most of the time it's not even noticeable unless you have an engine monitor and you're watching your EGTs. Uh, because we have two spark plugs in each cylinder, and as long as one of them is firing, uh, that, that's enough to keep the cylinder producing power. So usually the only sign that a spark plug has failed in flight is if you're looking for it, and if you have the proper in instrumentation, that the EGT on the affected cylinder will rise about 50 degrees or so, sometimes a little more than that. And the EGT rise is is uh, uh, is indicative of the fact that only one plug is is firing in the cylinder instead of two um and and unless you have an engine monitor and unless you put it in normalized mode which um, is the mode where all the, the bars get uh, evened up right at the center of the display and and the sensitivity of the display increases quite a bit uh, you probably won't even notice a spark plug failure in flight uh, most of the time, these failures are caused by some sort of crud getting lodged in the spark plug electrodes. Um, could be oil, could be carbon, could be lead. Um, and sometimes those failures self-resolve. I've seen this happen in my airplane quite a bit, um, where 
I'll be flying along and all of a sudden an ETT will, will pop up and I, I do an in-flight mag check and I see that one of the plugs has stopped firing. And I pull out a post-it note and I make a note of which spark plug it is so that when I get on the ground, I can, I can uh, change the spark plug. And then, you know, 10, 15 minutes later, all of a sudden the problem will resolve itself. And that's because some crud got lodged in the spark plug and um, eventually under the, the pounding of, the, uh, of all the combustion events that whatever the crud was gets dislodged and the plug returns to firing status by itself. Um, depends on what kind of fouling it is. Uh, if it's lead fouling, it probably won't clear itself, but if it's uh, oil or carbon fouling, it might very well. Um, here's a spark plug trade just came out of a one of our clients aircraft recently. He was having some ignition issues and uh, he, he was using fine wire spark plugs, which are very, very uh, resistant to fouling. And, and one of them, uh, the picture just entranced me. So I thought I'd show it to you, which was a uh, one spark plug that had a big, huge glob of metallic lead lodged in it. And, and had that been a, a, uh, a massive electrode spark plug, it definitely would have shorted out. But because it was a fine wire spark plug and because the glob of lead just happened to lodge in a place that it didn't short the electrodes out, the, the plug continued firing like that. But it gives you an idea of the kind of stuff that can cause, cause spark plugs to fail. But you know, even even if, if the problem doesn't self-resolve, spark plug failures often aren't caught until unless you're really looking for them on your engine monitor uh, until the next pre-flight when you do a mag check and discover that that you have an excessive mag drop on one of the mags and the engine is running rough. Um, but it, it's often not even noticed. Now. Failures of magnetos themselves uh, happen less often, but when they do happen, the consequences can be a lot more serious uh, or not, depending on what the failure mode of the magneto is. Uh, if, the meet, if, if the magneto just quits cold, let's say because the breaker points fail or the coil opens up or the condenser shorts or something, then the consequences of that magneto failure are relatively benign because basically it's just putting half the spark plugs out of business, but the other half of the spark plugs that are connected to the other mags, uh, mag still works. Um, all the cylinders continue to make power in, in single ignition mode, all of the EGTs rise together um, and you fly to your destination and get the, the bad, bad mag fixed. You know, it's, it's no big deal. On the other hand, there are failure modes of magnetos uh, that affect the magneto timing. And those can be a, a very big deal, particularly if the timing winds up getting advanced, that is the spark plugs fire too early, um, in, in which case you, you can have a pretty bad uh, things happen in the combustion chamber, uh, detonation, pre-ignition. Um, a mag that fires five degrees early will send CHTs through the roof. A mag that fires at 10 degrees early can melt holes and pistons and cause cylinder heads to separate, destroy spark plugs, uh, pretty bad, bad stuff. Uh, one of the worst kinds of magneto failures um, and one that we've been seeing with some frequency is our failures of the uh, distributor gear. Um, if, if you were on the, the webinar last week, we, we dissected the magnetos and you remember that there's a big distributor gear that, uh, that, that has a finger on it that, that goes around and, and uh, uh, distributes the, the spark energy to the proper spark plug. Um, and it's made of plastic. It, it's uh, a, lot, a lot of stuff in the mags are made of plastic because it, it has to be non-conductive under high voltage conditions. And um, sometimes this distributor gear will, will fail by, by shedding teeth. You can see uh, an example in the, in the picture here. And um, when that happens, the, the distributor gear can stop turning or it can start turning more, more likely start turning 
really erratically and get totally out of sync with what it's supposed to be doing. Um, here's here's some more pictures of different distributed gears that that failed. So, um, and if, if the distributor gear gets out of sync and starts uh, you know firing random spark plugs at random times not at the right not the right cylinder at the right time all hell can break loose with the engine it can go really berserk and and run extremely rough change of underwear rough i hope you appreciate my uh, image there um and this is a problem that happens um more than i would like um during uh, a two-year period uh, I counted six such magneto failures, dis uh, distributor gear failures of the kind that we were just seeing, which I think is kind of like the, the worst kind of mag failure, at least from a pilot's point of view. Um, in a fleet of about 300 piston GA airplanes that we were managing at the time, we're, we're now managing a lot more than that, but uh, this was a two-year period a few years ago. Um, and we, we we had six such magneto failures in a fleet of 300 airplanes in the two-year period which worked out to an average of one failure per year per 100 airplanes which is a bit distressing um of course you know not to worry that's why the faa requires that our engines have two magnetos and even if one mag goes berserk like that we still have a healthy one to get us home right well don't be so sure Here, here's the here's the interesting part um, of course, I investigated each of those magneto distributor gear failures quite thoroughly because they happened in, in uh, airplanes belonging to 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 our clients. Um, and it, it happened to all sorts of pilots, ranging ranging from from newbies to veteran multi thousand hour CFIs. They occurred in all phases of flight, from a traffic pattern up to flight level two one zero. And in these six of these six failures with all kinds of different pilots under all sorts of different conditions not once did the pilot have the presence of mind to uh, try uh, one mag at a time identify which one was bad and shut it off um in fact the the, the one that, the thing that was most astonishing to me was that the one that occurred up at flight level 210 it was in a turbocharged cirrus um, the pilot was an experienced pilot. Um, he was flying uh, in the vicinity of Cincinnati, Ohio. It took him a half an hour to get down from flight level 210 and land at Cincinnati Lunkin Airport. He had a half an hour to troubleshoot the issue, and it never occurred to him to, to try to isolate which mag was bad. Um, and so in every one of those six cases, whether the pilot was high time, low time, high altitude, low altitude, the pilot declared an emergency, pulled the power back because the engine was shaking like crazy, and landed at the nearest airport. Now, fortunately, all of those emergency landings were uneventful and didn't, didn't bend anything um, other than the state of the pilot's underwear. But um, this highlighted to me the fact that we had have a, a real training problem uh, had these pilots been taught to deal with a failure like that by shutting uh, by identifying and shutting off the bag magneto um, their engines would have resumed smooth operation on the good magneto and the airplanes could have continued uneventfully to the planned destination without declaring an emergency or making a big deal out of it but none of the pilots did that um, when an engine starts running rough, it is counterintuitive to turn off a mag. <laughs> uh, you know, the the the, the pilots will, will go full rich and turn on a boost pump and do all sorts of stuff. But what they won't do is, is shut off a mag, which is what you need to do in order to isolate which one was bad. And I think it's partially because pilots aren't educated in the fact that, that magnetos can fail in this way. That when they think about magneto failure, they think about a magneto that just is goes dead. And, and as I mentioned, that's kind of a benign situation. But when a magneto goes crazy, um, that, that requires a little bit more uh, ingenuity in the cockpit to try to fault isolate the problem and then shut off the bad magneto. 
so it seems to me that we have an education problem here. Um, that's one of the reasons I'm, I decided to do this webinar and talk about it a little bit. Um, the, the, you know, pilots uh, just need need to be taught to 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 do this. That they need to be taught that this is a a known failure mode of magnetos, and that if their engine starts running extremely rough, um, one of the things that they need to do is try one mag magneto and the other until they find out which magneto will make the engine run smoothly and then just leave it on that magneto until they get on the ground. Now, talking about magneto failures, I can't um, resist talking a little bit about the um, the Bendix the dual magneto that's on a lot of like homing engines. Um, and I wrote a column about this uh, some years back that was entitled, or one and a half mag, mags enough. <laughs> um, we were talking about the, the Bendix D3000 dual magneto, which I discussed briefly um, last month. Um, it's used on many like homing engines. Uh, in fact, if you have a like homing engine and the um, model number of the engine ends in the letter D, like an 0360 A1 F6D or a TIO 540 F2BD uh, or an 0320 H2AD, if it ends in a D, it's got one of these one of these puppies on it. Um, and what the D3000 is, is it's two magnetos packaged into a single housing with a single drive shaft mounted on a single pad on the accessory case. And, and this this was somebody's brilliant idea in order to save real estate uh, on the ra rather crowded uh, accessory case of a, of a Lycoming engine and to reduce a little bit of the accessory gearing required and so on. Um, but to be honest with you, this probably wasn't Lycoming engineering's best idea. Um, a lot of owners and mechanics have had bad experiences with the dual mags. Uh, I've had some CFIs tell me that they won't fly a single engine airplane that was is dual mag equipped, although an awful lot of them are. Um, and the issue with the dual mag is that it doesn't provide as much redundancy as two conventional mags. There are a number of single point failures that can affect both mags in the dual mag assembly simultaneously, which compromises the redundancy that's required by FAR 3337 that we looked at earlier. Um, and frankly, I'm a little bit surprised that this dual mag got got certified um, because it really, uh, maybe it meets the letter of 3337, but it doesn't seem to meet the spirit of it, to be honest with you. Um, one of the problems that we've seen with these dual mags is um, has to do with the magneto clamps. The the, the mag is attached to the uh, accessory case of the engine, uh, Lycoming engine, with with two clamps um, that allow the the mag to be rotated um, in the mount until the timing is correct and then the nuts get tightened and the clamps hold the, the mag in position. And there's there's been issues with these clamps coming loose and allowing the magneto to rotate and, and, and it's timing to get off. And of course, if you have a dual mag, it affects the timing of both of the mags, which is not a good thing. It, you, I mean, the, the same kind of problem could happen with conventional mags, but it would only affect one mag. But in this case, if, if this dual mag rotates, um, and it is a pretty massive thing, it's it's, it's quite heavy. Um, and if it's if it's able to rotate in the mount, that, then both mags get off timing, and, and bad things can happen. And uh, I don't know if you can see it in the in the lower right hand corner of this of this rather busy slide, but Lycoming's gone through three different iterations of these clamps, trying to get one that would that, that would not slip. Um, and the, the newer one is a little bit better than the, than the two older ones because it, it, uh, it, it 
there's a greater contact area with the with the magneto flange. But the you know the point is if if um, if these things aren't torqued exactly right and they start to slip, uh, then then both of your mags will wind up getting off time at the same time. That's not a good thing. So that's kind of a one of these single point failures that can affect both magnetos if you have the dual mag. Another one is the impulse coupling. We talked about that um, uh, last last month, and and uh, the impulse coupling is is a contraption that that sits on the the shaft of the mag and and uh, provides uh, for helps the engine get started. Um, and it's got a whole bunch of components to it, and and impulse couplings have a a non-trivial failure rate. And if you have a dual mag, you have one impulse coupling on the single drive shaft. And if the impulse coupling goes bad, it, it's going to take out both of the mags. I learned of, of, a, of a new single point failure on this just the other day when when, when somebody sent me an email that they, that they had had a, a failure uh, in, a, in their Lycoming engine that forced them to uh, uh, to uh, I guess it, it was an engine failure on takeoff, and it afford, uh, forced them to uh, to abort, um, which they did successfully. And it turned out to be the the screw that holds the cam on. And again, here's here's a an opened up view of the of the back of the of the dual mag, and you can see that that the dual mag has a single cam that drives two sets of breaker points, one for each mag. And the cam, like most Bendix um, mags, is is secured with with a screw. And you loosen the screw, you turn the cam until the timing is just right. This is the way you adjust the e-gap, the internal timing of the mag, and then you tighten the screw. Well, if that screw comes loose, um, the the cam starts to slip. And again, if if you had conventional mags, this would screw up one of your mags, but you'd still have the other one. In this case, if it's a dual mag, uh, that that screw coming loose is is going to it's going to wind up taking out both mags. So, although the dual mag complies with the letter of FA's two source requirement, I, I it does doesn't provide the same level of redundancy as two conventional mags. Um most Lycoming engines that have the, that that use the dual mag can be converted to use conventional mags, but it requires replacing the accessory case, changing a bunch of gearing. It's not the sort of thing you would normally do except at engine overhaul time. But if you are if you do have one of these engines with the dual mag and you're and you're about to get it overhauled, you might want to look into the possibility of of uh, Changing it over to uh, to a configuration that that uses a, a conventional mags because it just gives you uh, just gives you more redundancy. Um, now the dual mags are not the only single point failures that can occur. There are some single point failures that that can that can take out two conventional mags at the same time, um, and I, I'll just talk about two of them. Um, one is is the ignition switch in the cockpit. Uh, the 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 mag switch in the cockpit. There are a couple of different brands. This is this is, happens to be the Gerties switch, but it's a kind of complicated switch. It's that's a it's that's driven by the you know it's a key operated switch, and its purpose is to um, to short out uh, one mag at a time or both mags. And also, it, it includes a, a switch to operate the starter. Um, and these switches have have uh, some some known failures. In fact, there are some ADs against them. And if the switch fails in a way that grounds out both mags simultaneously, you you just lost your entire ignition system. Doesn't happen very often, but it it, it can happen. And uh, and I've I've talked to some owners that that have had this. Issue and they they actually had mag problems. They replaced both of their mags with overhaul mags. Didn't solve the problem. They replaced harnesses and everything. Finally, they were they were able to trace the problem down to to a bad mag switch. 
which was the last thing they were thinking about when they were troubleshooting the problem. Um, a, an, another interesting one, this only really affects uh, turbocharged aircraft, but a lot of turbocharged aircraft, particularly ones that use uh, slick mags, use they use pressurized mags in order to prevent the magnetos from cross-firing up at high altitude. And, and the, the mag case is sealed up and it's fed uh, pressurized air from, from, the, uh, from the turbocharging system. Um, and the, the air from the turbocharging system that, that goes into the mags goes through uh, this uh, filter. That there's a picture of it on the left side of the slide. It's a, a plastic uh, filter with a with filter element in it. And its purpose is to, to make sure that, that any uh, any uh, crud or any moisture or anything that that uh, is is pumped in from the uh, induction system of the engine uh, won't get into the mag and contaminate things. And for some reason that I have never understood, because it seems so ridiculous to me, every single pressurized mag installation I have ever seen on any airplane uses a single filter to filter the air that goes to both mags. And after it gets through the filter, it then is teed uh, into two hoses, one that supplies pressurized air to each of the two mags. Um, and this sets up a single point failure. And in particular, uh, one of our clients who was flying, I believe it was Cessna 414 at the time, he was up at the flight levels flying along, and all of a sudden, um, one of his engines just started going completely berserk. Um, it turned out it was going into high altitude misfire. And what had happened was that one of the plastic nipples on this filter um, just fatigue fractured off. And so both mags lost pressurization simultaneously and both of them went into high altitude misfire. He, he declared an emergency, he descended to a lower altitude. Once he got to a lower altitude, the mag started operating properly. Um, he got on the ground, reported the situation. We told him that he, he better have the mags uh, pulled off and, and, and opened up for a 500 hour inspection. And when they inspected the mag, they discovered a tremendous amount of internal damage in the mags from these cross firings. A bunch of plastic parts were melted and stuff like that. And the mags required kind of major repair before they were airworthy again. But this is another single point failure um, that can take out you know, both mags. So the fact that you have two magnetos is very, very helpful, but it's it, it's still possible to have failures that affect both mags simultaneously. Uh, so that brings us to the subject of magneto inspections. Um, mags have um, a lot of parts in them that can go bad, a lot of plastic things. They have a lot of um, uh, parts that, that are basically consumed in operation to be replaced periodically, like uh, there's a carbon brush that, that uh, provides the high voltage path from the coil to the distributor gear that, that wears down and needs to be replaced occasionally. There are felts that need to be lubricated. There's a lot of stuff in mags that, that need work. Um, now, magnetos normally receive only a cursory inspection during annual or 100-hour inspections. They normally are not taken apart. Uh, the mag to engine ignition timing is checked and adjusted if necessary. Uh, occasionally, uh, the, the um, breaker points are checked for condition, but that's not always done at 100-hour at inspections. But uh, nobody opens up the mag during 100-hour inspection and looks inside because to do that you have to pull the mags off the engine and and disassemble them. Um, now both uh, uh, Bendix and Continental, Bendix is owned by Continental and uh, Slick which is now owned by Champion, those are the two companies that make mags and both of them recommend that their mags be removed from the engine opened up for a, a 500 hour disassembly inspection uh, every 500 hours and, and although um, that's only a recommendation from the manufacturer. It's not compulsory for part 91 operators. Um, I have personally 
become convinced of the importance of doing these things religiously. And doing 500 hour inspections sort of goes against my grain generally philosophically because I'm a big believer in doing maintenance strictly on condition. But the problem with magnetos is that unlike a lot of components on the engine uh, or on the, on the aircraft, there's, there's no way to assess the condition of magneto without taking it apart. You can't stick a borescope in a magneto and look around. You can't, there's, there's, there's no you know, filter you can check for metal or uh, send out for oil analysis or anything like that. Um, th there's really no way of telling what's going on inside a magneto without taking it off the engine, taking it apart. Um, so um, I've become a big believer that, that doing these 500 hour disassembly inspections is very important. Um, and, uh, and again, although under normal circumstances, I, I would consider that a component that's part of a fully redundant system uh, to be one that you run to failure. I mean, like I have two vacuum pumps and I, you know, I run the vacuum pumps to failure because I've got two of them and, and one of them's enough to run the systems in the airplane. And, and that logic, um, in my mind, unfortunately doesn't apply to magnetos because history has shown that pilots don't do well in the face of a magneto failure, at least the kinds of magneto failures that, that cause the engine to go berserk. They, they, they you know, the, the redundancy doesn't really help you if you don't know how to take advantage of it. And that just seems to be what we're seeing <clears throat> when these things have these nasty failure modes that, that pilots don't fall isolate them and put the engine on the on the good mag they they consider it to be a major emergency so during a 500 hour inspection um, the you take everything apart inspect the magnetos uh, plastic parts like the distributor gear um, replace it if it looks at all shaky replace variable cons various consumable items like the carbon brush lubricate a whole bunch of internal parts uh, that, that, that need to be lubricated periodically. Um, typically, they, they require special lubricants that are only used on, on magnetos. Um, inspect the condition of the breaker points, reset the point gap to specifications, research, re reset the mag's internal timing, which is uh, called the E-gap, um, uh, to make sure that the mag is generating the maximum possible voltage. On the Bendix mags, that's done by loosening that screw and and rotating the cam uh, to to a particular position. It's done a little bit differently on slick mags. Uh, now, some A and P's have the knowledge and tools and inclination to to do these 500 hour inspections in their themselves in the shop, but a lot of them uh, prefer to send mags out to a magneto specialty shop. I used to do my own 500 hour inspections, uh, but I've I've gotten lazy, and uh, nowadays I tend to send mine out. There, there are a number of good magneto specialty shops around the country, um, and, and and frankly, they they can do they can do a better job uh, of of doing the 500 hour because they've got uh, better test equipment and so on. Um, if your shop does send your mags out, or if you ask them to send them out. Make sure what you ask for a 500 hour IRAN rather than an overhaul. Um, there's really no need to overhaul a magneto uh, except when the engine is overhauled. When the engine undergoes a major overhaul, then magnetos legally have to either be replaced with new or, or go through a major overhaul. But that's, that's kind of overkill. Uh, the 500 hour IRAN is what is required. And the difference is that. With, the, with an IRAN, the, the mechanic who's doing it can assess the condition of the components in the mag and decide which ones need to be replaced and which ones look okay. In the case of an overhaul, his hands are kind of tied. He has to replace a whole bunch of parts that are listed in the overhaul manual, regardless of condition. So it's, it's, it's a lot better to, to, to give the technician a little latitude about what needs to be done. So always ask for a 500 hour IRAN when you send mags in for uh, uh, at the 500 hour point. And I really recommend doing that. It, it's pretty important. Uh, Tim, that's all I have as far as prepared material, but we can open it up for some Q&A. 
All right, Mike, sounds good. A lot of questions have come in so far, and uh, a lot of them dealt with um, electronic ignition systems and different various types of questions. They all kind of boil down to something like Chris asks here. Would having one EMAG be a good redundant system because they have different failure modes? Well, I, I'm actually a big fan of the EISs. I, I talked about that just a little bit last month that. Um, the FAA has been um, a, a bit reluctant uh, as far as certification is concerned. Um, om almost all of the, the the experimentals that we that we deal with uh, have uh, you know dual EMAGs installed, um, and 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 it's a, it's a, it's definitely a better mousetrap. There's just no question about it. Um, but so far, the FAA has has um, allowed one uncertified engines and ha has uh, allowed, uh, or actually certified airplanes, has allowed one of the magnetos to be replaced with a, an EIS. Um, but so far, they've they've not gone for having both of them be replaced by an EIS. And I'm I'm hoping that they come around. But yeah, I I I definitely think that that um, magnetos are are dinosaurs and that. Um, the EIS is a much better idea. We, we've, because I deal with mostly certified airplanes, uh, uh, we've dealt um, mostly with the Electro Air and the Surefly uh, EISs, which are the two that are STC'd for single mag replacement on certificated engines. And we've had um, we've had very good luck with the Surefly. Uh, they, they had some some infant mortality problems when they first came out, where the mags would were very sensitive to electrical fluctuations, electrical system fluctuations, and they would sometimes let down momentarily, which uh, didn't make the pilots very happy. Um, but they they fixed that in the firmware, and they don't do that anymore. Um, we've we've had a little bit more problem with the electro airs, but but pretty good luck with with both systems, frankly, and. Um, uh, and um, I'm a I'm a big fan of it. I just I wish the FAA would get to where they would um, permit uh, both mags to be replaced. And and also the if you have a Lycoming engine with a dual mag and it's a certificated airplane, you kind of got a problem because um, because of the FAA's unwillingness to allow both magnetos to be replaced with an EIS and certificated airplanes. There's not a good solution for for a dual mag engine to to retrofit it with an EIS right now, um, and hopefully the, the FAA will change its tune on that at some point because there are quite a lot of these Lycomings that that are that have the D suffix and are using the dual mag, and the dual mag is sufficiently problematic that it would be definitely great to be replacing them with EISs. Um, so a few questions kind of here go together. Uh, Sigmund wonders, why not just replace the mags at the 500 hour mark? And, and then Roger asks, what's the typical cost to, to either do a rebuild or an IRAN on a mag? Um, well, the, it, I was just actually looking the other day, um, at, at like what, what Continental was charging for uh, uh, for uh, factory rebuilt um, Bendix S1200 mags, which are the kind of mags that I use in my airplane, and, and it was about two grand. It was it was surprisingly expensive. Um, the the IRANs typically run around I don't know five six hundred bucks um, to to IRAN the mag. It, you know, it kind of depends on with an IRA. It kind of depends on what they find when they open it up. How much stuff needs to be replaced? Uh, if the if the distributor block is is cracked or contaminated or something like that and needs to be replaced, the the cost can be more. But most of the time, five or six hundred bucks is is in the ballpark for for doing the IRAN. So the the reason <laughs> the, the the reason to to send your mags out for an IRAN rather than to replace them is an economic reason. Uh, yeah, it's, it's it's quite a bit cheaper. 
John wonders, uh, what's the typical turnaround time for a magneto, Iran? Um, well, I suppose it depends on the shop. But generally, we, we figure about a week. And Jeff's wondering, does one brand of mag have a better history than another brand? Uh, yes. <laughs> Uh, the, the 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 slick mags historically are are, are the worst. Um, the Bendix S20 S200 mags, which are their their, their smaller mags, are are better. And the S1200s, which are the big giant Bendix mags, are, are by far the best mags. Uh, but unfortunately, because they're so large. Um, they won't fit on on, on some engines. Uh, you don't have the option of putting them on because they're they're just too big. So I have S twelve hundreds, and and if if you have a choice, those are the best mags. But it, not every engine can can be fitted with S twelve hundreds. And Keith is wondering: Would replacing the key switch with a pair of rocker switches preclude the issue of grounding both magnetos with the key switch? It probably it probably be, would would help again if it's a certificated airplane. I, that would be a major alteration um, to to do that, and and it would require you know at least a field approval or something like that um, for an experimental. Obviously, you can do anything you want, and you know in in twins like the one I fly, we don't we don't use key switches. We use individual toggle switches, and they're vastly more reliable and. Uh, than than the than than the, the key operated switch that's so ubiquitous in single engine airplanes, but yeah, I think frankly the you know, if you have a choice, which you do if it's an experimental, um, using using toggle toggle switches uh, to control the individual mags is a, is is more reliable than using one of those rotary switches. Let's see, Gerald wondering, are most distributor gear failures caused by mechanics rotating the prop with the timing pin still in place, which cracks and weakens the plastic gears? Well, that's a good question. Um, I, I, I've never seen any data one way or the other to indicate what causes those failures. Um, the, the failures, you know, if if a mechanic um, left a, left a, a, a timing pin, in, and actually the timing pin is really only something that would apply to to slick mags. I don't think we use timing pins on on Bendix mags, and the most of the failures I've seen of the distributor gear have actually been on Bendix mags. Um, but you know, a single tooth failure could be accounted for by by that but we we also see as you can see in some of those pictures we also see cases where where a whole bunch of of, of adjacent teeth wound up failing and uh, it's a little hard to imagine that being caused by, by a timing pin and as, as i said i don't we, we don't normally use timing pins for for bendix mags they 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 have little little red marks on the on the gear tooth that you line up um but i i, I do know that the timing pins are used um uh used on, on on when doing the timing on 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 slick mags normally the timing pin wouldn't be in there when the mag is actually on the engine anyway that's something that we use um d during the during the during the IRAN when the when the mag is off the engine. Joe wonders: Is there a service bulletin that recommends changing to the newest mag clamp for the D three thousand? I think my engine has one of the older clamps on it. I'm pretty sure there's a service bulletin about that, and I'm pretty sure there's not an AD. But but if you have if you have the the uh, the dual mag, it's it, it'd be a really good idea to use the 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 newer style clamp that that has a larger contact area and is much less likely to let the mag slip. Jeff wonders, can you change a Lycoming dual mag to uh, two single mags in their place setup? 
you, you can, but it requires putting a different accessory case on the engine and the, the engine winds up getting a, a different model number after the, after the overhaul uh, that, that, that doesn't have a D at the end of it. Um, it it's, a, it's a moderately big deal to do it. So it's not the kind of thing you would do except at, at, at an overhaul when the engine's all apart. Todd wonders, is it possible to have a mag gear fail to the point, i.e. where it totally breaks apart to the point that there could be some cascading other failure, like broken off parts, jamming something, causing something else to fail? I've never, I've never seen that. Um, I've never seen that happen. The only, the only distributor failures that I've seen have been the ones like that, that I showed in the pictures where t teeth just, just get stripped off the gear and then the gear starts turning really erratically. And Jason wonders, in the event of a crazy magneto, what would happen if you shut off the good mag and remain on the crazy mag? Would the engine roughness become worse? Oh, I don't know if it would become worse. It it, it would certainly be pretty bad. And, um, but you know, it only it would only take a, a a matter of a couple of seconds to 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 try each mag individually. And and if, you know, if if the engine smooths out on on one mag, you just leave it there. It's it seems kind of obvious when you talk about it, but it apparently when you're in the cockpit and things are shaking and it's really scary, it, that's not what that's not 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 what people do and and that's something i think we need to we need to train pilots better at it, i mean it's understandable that it's that, that it's um difficult to 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 think about shutting off a magneto when the engine is going berserk but that's really what you have to do in order to isolate the problem it's kind of like you know it's counterintuitive to push the nose down when, when the airplane stalls, but it's something we're taught until it becomes reflexive. And this ought to be something similar to that. Thomas wonders why aren't ceramics used instead of plastic for the gears? Wouldn't that material be more reliable? It, it, I don't know, it might. I'm not a materials engineer, but I mean, the answer to that is that these damn things were certified back in the forties and they haven't changed very much since then um it, it, it's just so hard it's so expensive to get stuff certified and you know if if you want to use two new technology instead of coming up with ceramic parts or a magneto we ought to be just getting rid of the doggone magnetos and putting in electrical electronic systems like we've had in cars for the last 20 years mm -hmm. Brian wonders, would you recommend a mag check as part of a post flight, for example, on taxi to your parking or fuel pump prior to final shutdown? Not a bad idea, but what I really recommend is doing in-flight mag checks. Uh, and, and, uh, in-flight mag checks with a, particularly with the engine leaned aggressively, because that's a much better test of the ignition system than anything you can do on the ground. Uh, it's 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 a, a much more demanding test of the ignition system uh, to to do do the mag check when the engine is operating at relatively high power and with a lean mixture because both of those things make uh, make it harder for the spark plug to ignite the the, the air fuel mixture and and therefore the the ignition system has to be in really good shape in order to uh, perform well in a in, a, in an in-flight uh, lean mag check. So uh, we recommend doing that on a regular basis in flight, um, and uh, it's 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 the best best test to um, that, that that I can think of. Uh, we we sort of call it an ignition system stress test because it, it tests the magnetos under or tests the whole ignition system under much more demanding conditions. The tests we do on the ground uh, is will only catch the the most, uh, you know, the, the really really bad problems. But it's it it doesn't take a lot of spark energy to ignite the fuel and air mixture when the engine is running at seventeen hundred or two thousand RPM uh, with a rich mixture on the ground. 
it's uh, it's a much more demanding test to do it in a flight and do it with a leaned out engine. So Paul just wonders if you could expand a little bit. Can you explain how to properly accomplish an in-flight mag check? Sure. Um, th there's actually, um, if if you're interested, if if you if you um, if you go to uh, the Savvy Aviation Resources site, it's resources at savvyaviation.com. There's there's a whole lot of documents there. There's all my magazine articles and everything. But one of the things that's there is is a document that we call a flight test profile, which is uh, which is the the, the in-flight procedure that we recommend to our clients, and it involves uh, two different in-flight tests. Uh, one is a GAMI lean test, which is a mixture distribution test, and the other is an ignition system stress test. Um, but you know, basically, we we like to set up the engine in in cruise, you know, say 65% power or something like that, um, and lean it as aggressively as possible, preferably lean a peak, um, and and then do do an in-flight mag check, uh, watching uh, the engine monitor. Uh, we want to see when you go to single mag operation. We want to see all, all of the EGTs rise, none of them fall, and once they've risen, we want them to be uh, fairly stable, and we want the engines to be running relatively smoothly. The engine will always run a little bit rougher on one mag than on two, but it it, it shouldn't run you know change of underwear rough. And if we're doing this to analyze the engine monitor data, which is what we ask our clients to do, um, we we want to do the the mag check fairly slowly, and uh, where where we go to one mag and and stay there for at least ten data sample times. So if the engine monitor is sampling once a second, we want to stay on that one mag for at least ten seconds. If the engine monitor is only sampling once every six seconds. We want to stay on that one mag for a whole minute uh, so that we get at least 10 samples so that we can look at the data and really check how the ignition system is doing. Um, and then go back to both for a similar amount of time, then go back to the other mag for a similar amount of time, and then go back to both. And um, that gives us a very, very good data to look at where we can get a really good idea of uh, how the ignition system's doing, if there are any marginal spark plugs, if the mag timing is off, all of that stuff becomes very obvious looking at the engine monitor data if you if you do an in-flight mag check like that. And a couple people are wondering, um, so Dixon wonders, what if the engine quits at your uh, mag check during your flying? Well, it's a good question. Um, First of all, let me let me say that in all the time that we've been doing this, it's never happened. <laughs> um, but it is certainly possible that if you had a bad magneto and that that it simply packed up and wasn't working, and you didn't realize it, and you did an in-flight mag check and you went to the bad magneto, the engine would quit. And so it, if that happens, and the likelihood of it happening is extremely small, but if it did happen, um, the, the the instinct would be to immediately go back to both, and if you do that, there's a good likelihood that you that you'll hear a fairly loud pop or or bang, because when the engine when you switch to the to the bad mag and the spark plugs are not igniting, the engine is still breathing in fuel air mixture, it's not getting ignited, and it's going out the exhaust valves. And so there's a fuel air mixture sitting there in 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 all of the exhaust plumbing. And then when you finally light off the engine, that that fuel air mixture that's sitting out in the exhaust plumbing will will light off and make a noise. Usually it doesn't hurt anything, but it usually scares the heck out of you. <laughs> and it can potentially damage things like muffler flame cones and so on. So the right way or the right way to deal with the situation, and again, it's probably something that will never happen to you. But but if it did happen, if if you did switch to one mag and the engine quit, the right thing to do is to pull the mixture control to idle cutoff, 
then go switch to mag switch back to both and then bring in the mixture control and relight the engine that way by doing it that way um, it'll clear all of the the, the the fuel air mixture out of the exhaust and there won't be anything to to cause that that after fire that we were talking about so that's the appropriate procedure uh, if if the engine was to quit during an in-flight mag check and again it, it just it only takes a couple of seconds to do it but it is a little bit counterintuitive uh, because if the engine quits the you know the impulse is always to switch immediately back to both uh, but the right way to do it is to pull the mixture switch back to both and then push the mixture back in jay wonders um does running the engine on lower power such as 65 percent power consistently result in longer mag longevity no no the mags won't, won't wouldn't care about that and several people are kind of wondering this that david is asking and uh, why does the egt rise on a single mag it seems like it should fall <laughs> well that's a good question I'm always glad a lot of people, people have asked yeah. perceptive questions like that. Yeah. And, and and here's the reason. Um, during normal two magneto operation, um, when the when the spark event happens, and mo mo in most engines both plugs fire basically simultaneously, because both mags are supposed to be timed together. In fact, if you have a dual mag, you don't have any choice. <laughs> um, but so what happens is that that two separate flame fronts get nucleated one by each spark plug and the flame fronts progress across the combustion chamber and sort of meet in the middle um and that that's how the combustion event plays out when you're on single mag operation there, there's only a single flame front and and it takes longer for that single flame front to progress all the way up across the combustion chamber and and consume um, all of the fuel. So the, the combustion event takes longer. And when the combustion event takes longer, it means that the, the gas is going to be hotter at the time the exhaust valve opens. In fact, if, it, if, it, if the combustion event takes long enough, um, uh, you can actually uh, um, start getting after fires in, in, in where, where the combustion event hasn't quite finished when the exhaust valve opens and and so there's still some unburned fuel that goes out the exhaust valve and finishes getting combusted out in the exhaust system and you and you hear a popping sound that that would be the case if the combustion event went very very slowly and we we sometimes have that happen uh, at, at very low power and very lean mixtures but the, the basically the answer is that the combustion event plays out slower. So by the time the exhaust valve opens, the 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 uh, the, the gas is still is 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 hotter. Um, it hasn't had time to cool off. It hasn't had time to 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 you know be converted into that heat be converted into mechanical energy, and so more energy is it, it gets wasted going out the ex, uh, out the exhaust and that's what we're seeing on the EGT gauge I, I Fred, hope that made sense <laughs> mm -hmm. Fred wonders uh, can you do an in-flight mag check if you don't have an engine monitor what do you look for well you'd look basically you'd look for the engine uh, not running rough uh, running smoothly on on each mag because that's all you'd have to look at if you have an engine monitor, we can see more, but uh, but but basically you, you'd want to make sure that the engine runs smoothly on each mag individually, with a with a, with the leanest mixture you can tolerate, or it can tolerate. <laughs> Rich is wondering: Is it valid to do mag checks at 1,000 RPM versus 1,800 RPMs? Well, I, I don't know what what you mean is it valid? It's it's uh, it the, the the higher the power you use, the the more demanding the the, the check is. 
you're not going to do any harm by shutting off a magneto when the engine is at is at a thousand rpm but it, it, it won't tell you as much michael wonders um i hear there is a mag switch rebuild kit is there an inspection requirement for the mag switch um there are uh, some of the switches, and there are various brands of switches, but some of the switches have ADs against them, uh, where the, the, they are required to go through a kind of a functional check um, at, at every annual inspection. Um, I'm not aware of of, a, of any kind of a time limit that says you know, when the switch gets you know X years old, it needs to be rebuilt or or replaced. I'm not aware of anything like that, but I do know that there are some ADs that require uh, functional checking of some brands of magneto switch. Alden is wondering, how often do mag failures cause other engine cylinder issues? Um, not often. Um, Again, a failure of a magneto that causes it to quit is not going to hurt anything. Um, a mag failure that that results in advanced timing can can do some pretty serious damage. It doesn't happen very often, but but it is something that that, that we see. But if the mag if the if the mag timing gets advanced because let's say the mag clamps um, uh, loosen up in the mag shifts or because something goes wrong with the distributor gear, um, you, it, it can induce um, pretty serious detonation in the cylinder that can, that can do some significant damage. And um, let's see, got a question here from Jack. I'm just wondering, you know, if the engine is running rough due to bad mag timing, um, how long can it run this way before serious damage is done to the engine? Oh, I mean, th there's no good answer to that because it kind of depends on how out of bounds the thing is. But basically, you know, my recommendation is um, that that you always need to monitor your cylinder head temperatures, um, preferably have a engine monitor that has a, a, a CHT alarm that you set at some reasonable threshold. And if the CHT gets above that, do whatever it takes to bring it back down. Um, if, 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 you know, advanced mag timing, anything, any of the stuff that, that can do damage is, is going to manifest itself um, by, by increased uh, cylinder head temperature. And so you need to set some boundary and I, I would say you know something on the order of 400 degrees for continental cylinders or 420 for lycomings and say if the cylinder head temperature ever gets above that i'm going to do whatever it takes reduce power or whatever to, to bring it back down again i'm not going to just sit there and let it happen um and that's the way that's the way you you, you uh, avoid uh, avoid damage. Well, when when cylinders get damaged, it's because there's a there's a thermal runaway. Um, I, I'm, actually, it's funny. I'm just writing up one of these right now for our, our weekly mailing that involved a, uh, an airplane that uh, where the, the 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 pilot was doing a touch and go, and he forgot to richen the mixture for the for the go, and he had one cylinder go into detonation and the cylinder head temperature got up to 550 degrees and stayed there for about five minutes. Um, and it was significant detonation event. He, they they bore scoped the cylinder, they couldn't see anything wrong with it. So they decided it was okay to fly. And when we looked at the engine monitor data on the, on the flight after the event, there, there was clearly something really, really wrong with that cylinder. So it, it, it needed to be pulled off. Uh, it was definitely damaged. Glenn wonders, could running rich cause a mag problem? No. 
I mean, how, how, the Magneto couldn't can't know what the mixture is. I mean, it, 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 it even doesn't know if the engine, you know, quits or not. If the if the propeller is it's windmilling, the mag's you know still doing its thing. It doesn't know. There isn't any feedback path between the cylinder and the magneto. A cylinder knows when a magneto goes bad, but a magneto doesn't know when a cylinder goes bad. Robert wonders, will turning the prop backwards affect a mag or other engine component? Um, not really. The, 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 there is a there's there's a, a piece of conventional wisdom that 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 I'm sort of convinced is something of an old wives' tale that turning the prop backwards could can, could cause a, a vacuum dry vacuum pumps to to fail. Um, I, I I've been turning the prop backward for a long time and I've never had a had a cause a vacuum pump failure, but the the turning them the prop backwards is certainly not gonna gonna hurt the magneto. And in fact, one of the, the the rules of thumb, if you have a if you have an engine that has uh impulse coupling uh magnetos, that that if you want to reposition the prop, you know, uh like in the parking place or something, it's better to turn it backwards because there's no chance that the impulse coupling will will snap and, and cause the engine to to fire when you if you turn it backwards because the impulse coupling only works in the forward direction david's wondering do you recommend using loctite on the dual mag hold down nut on um, the hold you mean the, the one that clamps the magneto to the engine I um, take it as that, yeah, that nut uh, that the turn. I, I imagine there's a stud there, and the nut is. Yeah, I've never, I've never heard point. anybody use Loctite on them. The problem is, if you do something like that, it's going to be, it, it's going to be really hard on the mechanic. <laughs> the next time the the magneto needs to be retimed or something like that, um, because that's something that happens pretty frequently, where you need to loosen those things up and and and, and adjust the magneto timing or timing to the engine. Uh, and of course, obviously, you have to take them off completely for the 500 hour. So, um, no, it, it, what's what's really important though is to is to is to torque them appropriately. Um, if they're torqued appropriately, they shouldn't move. And again, the the dual mag is a little bit problematic because it's it's so heavy and it's so it's a really good idea to use the latest style clamp on there that has greater contact area and, and again is. A lot less less likely to to let the mag slip. Frank wonders if you have slick mags, can you change to Bendix mags? Yes, you can. Um, it it requires changing the the ignition harness too, because the ignition harness uh, that fits Bendix mags is not compatible with the ones that fit slick mags. So there's a little bit more to it than just swapping the mag. But yes, you can convert from slick mags to Bendix mags. Scott says, I my mags had less than 50 hours since new. My engine was hard to start, though. I sent my mags in, and they found the internal timing was way off. Is that common? Well, it shouldn't be on a brand new mag, but um, that obviously means that there was some sort of quality assurance problem at the. Uh, if, if, if the, these, the, did he say that they were slick mags? Didn't say. Oh, okay um but no obviously the 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 uh, the internal timing should be spot on and the internal timing of the mag which is also called the e gap um doesn't have to do with when the spark fires that's that's the external timing but it has to do w with uh, when the points open with in relationship to where the rotating magnet assembly is and it's adjusted uh, to provide the maximum output voltage uh, for the magneto, and if it gets misadjusted, the magneto will still work, but it but it, it will produce a wimpy spark, and you, you you're most likely to notice that during starting. Uh, it'll it'll make it'll make the the engine hard to start. Huh. Joe wonders, in your opinion, is the AD on slick mags caused by high resistance in champion plugs? 
I, I'm not sure what AD we're talking about, but we have seen slick mags, slick mag failures caused by high resistance uh, plugs where the the resistor assembly in the plug uh, goes to, to to high resistance and the as a result the the mag starts cross firing internally because the spark is going to take the path of least resistance and if if it if it's too hard to fire the spark plug either because the resistor's gone bad or the, the spark or the plug gap has gotten too large or whatever um, then it's that then the spark can crossfire inside of the mag and when it does that it can cause it can cause internal damage and robert's wondering what do you see in capacitor failures um when the capacitor fails well obviously if it fa if it if it fails shorted then the mag quits if it fails open um then basically the 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 points start arcing and they they start getting badly eroded and and eventually the mag timing will 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 go off and in an extreme case the mag could quit altogether but but basically if the capacitor goes if the condenser goes bad then the the, the points are going to start getting getting eaten up because it's going to be arcing across the points Tim wonders, uh, what's the failure mode of the condenser? Well, they 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 uh, they get old, and um, the, the 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 those things tend to last, you know, maybe ten calendar years or something like that. But they 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 um, are electrolytic capacitors, and they and they they, they dry out and and go bad. So normally when the mags go in for a 500 hour uh the, the mechanic will check the date code on the uh on the capacitor and if it's if it's too old in calendar time uh then they'll get replaced and and they're not horribly expensive to replace so that kind of answers Keith's question i don't know maybe there's more to it but he's wondering is age a driver for iran for mags too or just hack hours the, the the only component I know of in the mags that that uh, deteriorate with age is is the condenser, and and it typically, as I said, you know, has a useful life of ten years or so. Um, everything mm -hmm. else in in the mag uh, wears with operating time, but but not really with uh, with calendar time. Tom wonders: Are there any warning signs that a mag may be approaching a failure? Um, well, I mean, it kind of depends on what kind of failure. If the, the, there's there's really no way of predicting, say, when a tooth is going to break off a distributor gear. But um, the the most of the times, the, the mags just sort of slowly deteriorate. And that, that lean in-flight mag check is the best way to um, to, to assess the, the condition because if, if the engine runs well on one mag uh, when it's at you know reasonably high cruise power and a, a very lean mixture then that tells you that the ignition system is doing really well okay uh let's see here we got a lot of questions Bruce, one <laughs> oh my God! There, and there's. I'm sorry, we're not going to get to all of them tonight. There's still probably a hundred questions sitting. Here. Oh my goodness! Um, oh yeah, we had a lot of good questions tonight. Um, Bruce uh, wonders uh, how many hours were on the six mags that failed, and was there a common reason why those mags failed? Um, I, I honestly don't don't know. Uh, we 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 were never able to get that much forensic data on, on those mags that failed. Um, you know, the owners were just interested in getting back in the air. And so we, we uh, I never did learn enough to be able to answer that. It's a, good, it's a great question. I wish I could answer it. Mm -hmm. uh, Robert wonders. And I, and I, haven't, I haven't seen as many of those gear failures in the last few years as I did then. So it may possibly be that that, that they had a bad batch of gears that were Kind of marginal. I don't know. Nobody's 
ever fessed up to that. There's not been any kind of service bulletin about that, but it is, it, it, I mean, it's just, it's possible that there may have been some, a bunch of gears that were not quite up to snuff. Hmm. Over the years, plastics has gotten better in quality also. Maybe that's a factor. Yeah. Uh, Robert wonders, is there a difference in engine roughness coming from a mag failure versus other reasons? Um, well, again, most mag failures are not going to cause engine roughness. Um, uh, the only ones that would would be something like a distributor gear failure. Um, the, the the mag failures are either just going to be uh, outright magneto quitting, which means all the cylinders go on to on to single mag operation, um, which which might cause the engine to, to to run rough if the if the other mag is a little bit marginal. Um, because having two mags, you know, covers up a lot of sins too. The, the, one of the things about running on two mags is that if one of the mags is is a little marginal, you probably won't even notice and, 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 unless the other mag goes away. Um, but you know, these failures where the distributor gear stops turning correctly, that that's that's an extremely distinct kind of roughness it's it, it, it's the, the engine is, just goes crazy and it's pretty scary it's it's not you know like the like typical roughness where, where one cylinder isn't producing as much power as the other it's uh it's just crazy stuff that's going on inside the engine and the sparks are igniting the fuel air mixture whenever they whenever they feel like it Randy wonders if you have any favorite uh, mag repair shops you could recommend. Um, yeah, there are, there are there are quite a few that we've been using. I I like uh, an outfit called Aircraft Magneto Service, which um, used to be up in the Seattle area and now is in Missoula, Montana, of all places. Um, but but it's a it's a, it's a really a really good shop. Um, We've done quite a few mags, the GN, GNN aircraft in Indiana. Um, I'd, I'd have to look there. There are a number of other mag shops that we've used, but I, I tend to send mine up to uh, Aircraft Magneto Service in, in Missoula. Jeff wonders if you could explain the physics of what's going on at uh, high altitude when magnetos misfire. Um, yeah, if 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 the mag is not pressurized, um, then um, then as the airplane goes higher and higher, this is a turbocharged airplane. Um, cylinder pressure remains at, at basically you know sea level pressure or higher because the turbocharging system does that. But the air pressure inside the magneto goes goes lower and lower, and um, um, high pressure air air is a much better insulator than low pressure air. So eventually, you get to the point where, uh, with the cylinder being pressurized and the mag not being pressurized, the 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 path of least resistance uh, winds up moving from the spark plug to the inside of the magneto and you get this high altitude misfire um, where sparks are jumping inside of the of the distributor block of the mag rather than, than across the, the spark plug. Um, and the, there are two solutions to high altitude misfire. One is to use big giant mags like on my airplane, the big S1200s, where everything is physically spaced so far apart that high altitude misfire is 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 not possible except at exceedingly high altitudes. Uh, the other solution, which is used a lot with slick mags, which are very small physically, is to pressurize them so that as the, so that the the, the mag is pressurized the same way the cylinder is, and uh, and and so you don't get the, this um, uh, loss of of 
you know, resistance inside the magneto because it remains pressurized just the same way the cylinders are. So I don't know if I explained that adequately, but that's the general idea. John wonders, is a blast tube uh, and cooling for magnetos necessary? I've never seen anything like that. Blast tubes are, are used on alternators and stuff, and I've seen them used on vacuum pumps, but magnetos normally don't get hot. Uh, they, they don't have cooling fins. I've never seen a case where, where, where there was a blast tube that was directing cooling air onto magnetos because they they don't get hot. They're very well heat sink to the engine. So it, I don't think that's normally something that's done. At least I haven't, haven't seen it. Colonel Mooney is wondering what can go wrong with P leads and how about harnesses? Well, that can go, go wrong with both. Uh, uh, the, the P lead is of course the, the wire that goes from the, the, the uh, terminal on the magneto, which is normally a terminal on the on the condenser, um, to the the switch in the cockpit that's used to shut off the mag. And um, uh, if the if if the P lead itself um, uh, breaks, then then you basically have just have a hot mag that you can't shut off. But if the shield um, breaks and that's a, a pretty common failure mode the the, the p lead is shielded and the shield is grounded in the at the magneto end um and, and the purpose of the shield is to prevent the 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 impulse um noise that that the magneto puts into that p lead from getting into the radios so if the if the shield on the P lead uh, fractures, then you start getting impulse noise in your radios. It's very be obvious in the comm radios. Sometimes it's it, it's a, it's enough to break the squelch. Most of the time it's not, but but when you're listening to something on the radio, you you hear a bunch of impulse noise, and that frequently is a P lead that has gotten itself ungrounded, um, just because something vibrated and 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 broke off the, the ground on the P lead, typically right at the crimp terminal or something like that. Um, ignition harnesses, um, they tend to gradually go, go bad over time, um, where the, the insulation in, inside the wires of the ignition harness leads, which are shielded, of course, shielded leads, um, gets to the point where spark can arc inside the lead from the center conductor to the to the shield rather than across the spark plug. Um, there there are ignition lead testers which which you get, generally you hook to each lead and you push a button and it puts high voltage pulses in there and measures the uh, uh, the resistance of the insulation. Um, or you know, some people just kind of replace them on general principles uh, on 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 uh, you know every every thousand hours or something like that. The, the the ignition harnesses seem to be more problematic in turbocharged airplanes that fly up at high altitude than than uh, than airplanes that that are normally aspirated and stay down at lower altitude. At least that's my general impression um but uh occasionally harnesses will have to be replaced i, I know i had a marginal ignition problem on one of my engines that, that i was tracking down for a while and it turned out to be it turned out to be a bad lead on the harness and i wound up replacing the entire ignition harness on that engine um so we, we see that happen from time to time hmm. Well, Mike, we've reached the end of our allotted time here, so I'd like to wrap it up. I sure do want to thank you. Excellent presentation. Looks like we had over 1,500 people tuned in tonight, so thank you all for tuning in. Thank you all for your questions. I apologize we didn't have time to get to all of them. Mike, take a moment, share your closing thoughts. Okay. I know it's late. I'll make it quick. Um, four books on Amazon. If you've read it, post a review. If you haven't read them, consider getting them. Um, 
If you're not on my email uh, distribution list for the uh, newsletter, and actually, although the slide says free monthly newsletter, we, we've been actually sending out some some weekly war stories too that, that are kind of interesting. I'm just about to send one out about a detonation event, uh, but it's it's kind of interesting stuff. If you want to be on the on the mailing list, you can either sign up at, at SavvyAviation.com or if you stay on for the post webinar survey, which I hope you do, uh, there's a, a checkbox or something on the survey that lets you say that you'd like to be on the mailing list and we'll we'll uh, we'll add you. Um, let's see. And the audio book, uh, I've, the manifesto audio book is now available on Audible. Uh, I'm working now on the on the audio version of the engines book, but it's a big project. It's going to take a while. But anyway, manifesto is available in audio book form if you're an audio book person like I am. Uh, and finally, the um, upcoming uh, first Wednesday of the month webinars. Uh, the, the next one in April is uh, called "How Risky Is Maintenance." And it's going to look at a, an FAA study that they, they did of uh, um, 10 years worth of NTSB accident reports looking for accidents that were caused by something a mechanic did uh, to try to get an idea of, of uh, how often that, those things happen and what sorts of errors are made, that, that uh, mechanic errors that cause um, accidents. Um, the May webinar called Annual Deadlock uh, is, is just an, an interesting story of a of a case where, where an aircraft owner and his IA got got uh, uh, in a in a disagreement about what needed to be done to his aircraft and there, there's some lessons learned from from the story. I thought it would be worth telling. And then the June webinar called What Plane Should I Buy um, is uh, is really talking about uh, um, um, the, the selecting an aircraft, to, a used aircraft to buy, especially if you're a first-time aircraft owner. Um, and we've we've done something like 800 pre-buys now uh, in 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 the last several years. So uh, we've I've been exposed to an awful lot of people buying aircraft, uh, and a lot of them were first-time buyers, and so. We've seen a lot of, of, of mistakes and a lot of lessons learned, and so wanted to talk about uh, some of some of my thoughts about uh, choosing an airplane to buy. And that's it. Uh, that's it, uh, Tim. We will see everybody next month. Well, thanks, Mike. Wonderful class. Sure do appreciate it tonight. And to everybody who tuned in, thank you for joining us. Everybody, have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Good night. <laughs>